Um, many of you know Joe Hunt, our terrific Annu at Noon committee member, who has uh, done such a great job over the years introducing our speakers. And we're thrilled to have, um, as much as we love having our faculty, having an alumnus or alumna here is, is even more special. So we're thrilled to have an alumnus speak to us today. But Joe, I'll hand it over to you. You can just use this. Okay, thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Northeastern at Noon. And today's presentation is going to deal with one of the leading leaders and personalities of World War II, namely Winston Churchill, and a decision he made early on in the war, which many consider to be pivotal to the eventual Allied success in defeating Hitler. And our speaker today, we're very glad to have him, author and lecturer, Alan Saltman. Now, Alan was born and raised nearby in Lynn, Massachusetts. And after high school, he attended Northeastern University, entering the College of, Ed of Engineering with electrical engineering as his major. But after two years in that program, he decided that just wasn't him. So he transferred to Northeastern College of Social Sciences and Humanities, aka Liberal Arts, where he graduated with a bachelor's degree in economics. He went on from there to graduate from Boston College Law School. And with those academic credentials, he began his professional career. The first step was to move to Washington, D.C., where he practiced government contract law for nearly 50 years. I suspect he liked it. Uh, for a good portion of that time, he was also the managing partner of a D.C. office of a government contract firm based in Atlanta. And in addition to that, for several years, he was also an adjunct professor of law at Boston College, something which necessitated his commuting between Washington, D.C. and Boston. Probably didn't like that too much. No. I didn't like commuting when I was an undergrad, let alone the later I think we can, many of us can relate to that, yes. Uh, when retirement, uh, appeared on the horizon, or as Alan so nicely puts it in his biographical information, on the glide slope toward retirement. I think that captures, at least for me, that feeling of when you're approaching retirement. And uh, so I thought I'd just have to quote it. On the glide slope towards retirement from practicing law, he started to write a book entitled No Peace with Hitler, Why Churchill Chose to Fight World War II Alone. Now that book has received excellent reviews and since its publication, he has lectured widely about the book, Churchill and World War II. In fact, this past November, he was honored to speak before the Jewish Historical Society of England in London. Finally, in addition to lecturing, he has also written articles about the parallels between Churchill and President Zelensky of Ukraine, as well as the current efforts to remove or deface statues of historical figures, such as Churchill, Thomas Jefferson, or Robert E. Lee, and so on. Currently, right now, he's working on his another book about how and why Neville Chamberlain surprisingly supported Churchill's no negotiation with Germany stance in the critical war cabinet debate of late May 1940. Well, that in itself is very interesting, but today we're also going to hear all kinds of interesting things as he tells us all about Churchill and his big decision to fight on no matter what. So let's begin today's presentation with a warm Northeastern at noon welcome for our speaker, Alan Salkman.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, now that he said it all, I don't know that I have much to say. But uh, no, there's, it, you know, there's there's a lot to say about Winston Churchill, uh, and to write a book about Winston Churchill, you either have to be a little crazy or a little bit uh, nervy, I suppose. There have, been, there have been more than a thousand books written about Winston Churchill, one of the great subjects. And here it is, uh, me, never a um, history major, but someone who's intrigued by Churchill. I decide that I have something to add uh, to the wealth of information out there about Winston Churchill. So uh, I got together with a psychiatrist and 784 pages, we think we have come up with an answer to the intriguing question of why Churchill took this no peace with Hitler, no negotiations with Germany stance when all around him was falling down. When I say all around him was falling down, all of Western Europe had just been conquered. Uh, France was teetering on the brink. Uh, the United States was not involved in the war. And uh, Britain was alone. There were members of his war cabinet and others who thought Churchill's stance was idiotic, insane, suicidal. They predicted that hundreds of thousands of Britons would be killed as the Blitzkrieg turned its attention to Britain through bombing. And then, of course, there was the uh, well thought of, well, it was thought that there would be an invasion of the British Isles, all at a time when Britain's professional army was stuck at Dunkirk and professionals in the Churchill administration estimated that there was about a 10%, that they might be able to get 10% of the men out of Dunkirk. So uh, for all intents and purposes, the likelihood was that Britain was not going to have a professional army to fight off the Germans. Now. Having read that and seen the movie Darkest Hours, which really portrays that, you can see why I might have said, what is there about this man that allowed him to reach that conclusion? I tried to put myself in his shoes. I could not reach the same conclusion. How could I condemn a half a million of my countrymen to almost certain death? Excuse me. As I said, hence, it only took 784 pages to uh, come to a conclusion. But one of the good things about that book, and we will be, I'll be signing books, and it, it'll be available if anybody wants to buy a copy after this. One of the good things about my book is that if you don't like it, it works as a very handy doorstop. And it, I, you know, it's a, it's a, so it's a twofer, you know. Um, if we're going to talk about what happened on May 28th, which is the day that the final word came down from Churchill that we will not fight, uh, we have to jump all over the map, really, to, to do that. And I'm going to start with May 10th. May 10th, on the morning that uh, Britain wakes up and finds that uh, Hitler had invaded all of Western Europe. They, he had invaded Belgium the Netherlands, and he had cut through the Ardennes forest in an attempt to, uh, just north of the Maginot Line, and he was going to invade France in that fashion. Uh, the French, of course, said that could never be done. Well, we know that that famous last words. Um, it was a fairly inauspicious day, and of course, that was also the day that Winston Churchill became prime minister. So you talk about inheriting uh, a bad situation. Uh, the ensuing three weeks, the word coming from Europe uh, was bad virtually every single day. So things went from bad to worst, and yet Churchill maintained his no negotiations position. 
Lord Halifax, for those of you who have, have seen the, um, the movie or, or have read into this, Lord Halifax, who was the foreign uh, secretary, was the one who was really urging negotiations, and uh, Churchill resisted. But as, as, uh, as Joe talked about, uh, I have been researching the fact that Chamberlain was critical to Churchill's being able to maintain that position. And uh, without that support from uh, Neville Chamberlain, Winston Churchill would be a footnote in history. We would not be here today talking about him. But th that story is for the, the next book, which will be out next spring, I think. Uh, OK, now, the question, why did Churchill oppose negotiations? Was he insane? Was he suicidal? No, I don't think he was either of those things. But in order to, to really assess that, we have to go all the way back to his childhood. He was born on November 30th, 1874. We don't have to go quite back that day, but we have to be in that neighborhood. Uh, he was uh, born to an aristocratic family. His father had a long history. Uh, that, that family had gone back at least to the time of Queen Anne when uh, she dubbed one of their, his ancestors as the Duke of Marlborough. And as I said, they were, they were a, a very uh, prominent fan. He said he was amongst the uh, three or 400 families. He, he came from the three or 400 families that uh, really ruled England. His mother was an American. Uh, she was a uh, young, very pretty woman who came from, a, uh, from new money. Uh, her father was a real uh, gambler in more ways than one and had made a lot of money and sent her over, as, as was the custom back then, for her to marry into the British aristocracy. And she did. She met uh, Randolph Churchill, and the two married. Uh, and they had two sons, Winston being the, the oldest. Now, here's a picture of Winston when he was a young man. Uh, I think he was probably about 10 or 11 here. And there's a picture of him younger with, with uh, his mother. I don't, there are better pictures of her. She really was a beauty. Um, here is his father, and if he looks stern, it doesn't begin to talk about how he was. Uh, he really disliked Winston and, and treated him uh, horribly almost from the start. Uh, the mother and father really had very little time for their children. Uh, they were engaged in the uh, London social scene, and their children were an afterthought. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, when he was seven, they sent him off to boarding school. They took him to the train station and basically gave him his fare and, and let him go off by himself. I, I dare say any of us would take a seven-year-old and just dump them off at a train station. Uh, the, when he was there, he also, at that school, he was beaten almost daily by the headmaster. Uh, he would write his parents for them to come visit, both at that, from that school and at, at the few other schools that he attended. And they would uh, have virtually no time to, they, they virtually never came to see him. And some of the letters he wrote, and we, and we quote some of them in the book, are, are just heartrending. You know, dear mommy, if you come to me, come see me. I'll give you a billion kisses. And she would not respond. Um, and his father wasn't as nice as that. His father thought he, was, he would never amount to anything, told him as much. Uh, he advocated for Churchill to, to take a military career. And Churchill thought that was great, that his father really had faith in him. Uh, that was not true. His father suggested that because he didn't think Winston could amount to anything any, in any other profession. And Winston did get into uh, Sandhurst, the uh, military academy for infantry and cavalry officers. Uh, unfortunately, it took him three times to do it. Uh, and when he, father, when he finally told his father 
that he had made it into Sandhurst, his father said, well, you barely did. You didn't qualify for the in infantry, you know, uh, very disdainfully. Uh, there was one occasion where Winston and his brother were coming home for Christmas vacation, uh, only to find out a day or so beforehand that his parents were going to be gone on a six-week trip to Russia. And so this long thought about reunion with his parents over Christmas never occurred. Uh, the only slightly positive thing that comes out of his childhood is that he had a nanny, uh, Mrs. Everest, and she was the mother that he never really had. He had a picture of her on his nightstand till the day he died. Uh, she taught him an awful lot uh, about morals, about being a good human being, and uh, how to love and be loved. Uh, he called her Wumi. So, as I said, he had an absolutely miserable uh, childhood. We covered the first, uh, his childhood in the first chapter of the book. All right, we're moving along. Oh, he, well, I don't really want to get to him yet. But uh, despite that, and the fact that he had every reason to be like many aristocrats of the time, just ne'er-do-wells. Basically, people in British society that all they did was drink and never achieve anything. He could very easily have fallen into that, into that uh, gutter. But there was some fortitude within him that allowed him to overcome these obstacles. That was very important and very important to, uh, to his ultimate decision because he, as we're going to talk a little bit about, he believed that, uh, maybe subconsciously, if not consciously, that if he could overcome all these obstacles that were thrown against him, so could the British public. There's nothing they couldn't achieve. So standing alone against Hitler, eh, that's nothing. Look at what I had to overcome. I, I, I had no parents, essentially, and, and yet I made something of myself, uh, ultimately winning a Nobel Prize and becoming the Prime Minister of England. It only took him 65 years to do that, but he, he still did it. All right. Now, of course, that was not the only obstacle that Churchill really had to deal with in his life before he got to be Prime Minister. The biggest single one being the time in 1915 when he was uh, <clears throat> first, ad first Lord of the Admiralty, and he did uh, he, he was dubbed the uh, person responsible for the disaster that became known as Gallipoli. Now, probably before I wrote this book, I couldn't have told you where Gallipoli is. Gallipoli happens to be in Turkey. It's on the European side of Turkey. It uh, it and the main portion of Turkey, the, the dividing line is, is the Dardanelles fought, leading into the Bosporus and up to Istanbul. The uh, Britain, and, and Churchill in particular, wanted to help out their Russian allies by maintaining uh, the Dardanelles as being open so that shipping could go from Britain and France to Russia and vice versa. And the Germans caught wind of this and mined the Dardanelles and cl basically closed it to shipping, which was not particularly conducive to either the British or the, uh, or the Russian. So Churchill said, look, we, we should take military actions and reopen the Dardanelles. In 1804, Britain had done the same in a war whose name escapes me, and they had done it by using naval forces. Uh, Churchill didn't really believe, and actually he had written, that you couldn't use naval forces any longer to, to, uh, to do a military action like this. So his idea, and he went to the, uh, the war cabinet, and we're in, in World War I now, uh, and said, 
I think we should do this. We have a stalemate going on in France where we're in trench warfare and nobody's making any progress. We really need to open a second front and to keep the Dardanelles open for shipping. Uh, there, there was great debate in the War Cabinet and ultimately uh, he was promised that he would be given, I think, 75,000 troops to help with uh, this project. And that seemed like Okay, fair enough. And at about two days after uh, that promise was made, it was withdrawn summarily. Now, here's where Churchill made his big mistake. He somehow convinced himself that they could do it even without troops. And so they tried to do it on a strictly naval basis, and it failed and failed fairly miserably. That, that was what I call phase one of the, of the Gallipoli campaign. Uh, when that happened, basically Churchill was pushed aside and uh, his superiors took over and actually the Navy was pushed aside and they decided, okay, we will in fact provide, I think it was 125,000 troops, we'll go at this full bore and we'll, we'll Take the Gallipoli. Uh, that proved to be incredibly disastrous. And over the course of eight months, uh, Britain lost uh, as many soldiers as we lost in the 12 years of the Vietnam War. So while Chamberlain, uh, Chamberlain, excuse me. I wish they had started with two different letters, Chamberlain and Churchill, but OK. Uh, while Churchill does bear some responsibility for that first phase, he does not bear responsibility for the second phase where really most of the deaths occurred. Notwithstanding that, after the naval campaign had failed, Churchill was ousted as First Lord of the Admiralty and given uh, the job, the lowest job in the cabinet, uh, and six months later, he, it, the job was so awful, he quit and became an officer, and he went to France to uh, be in charge of uh, a, a division there. Notwithstanding all that, Churchill has borne the stigma of Gallipoli and he, to today, really. Uh, a lot of people don't remember much about it, but they said, what about, what about Gallipoli? You know, and that was one of his big failures. I, I think that, that's a slander that doesn't truly befit him. Uh, Gallipoli, war, he wore Gallipoli as uh, a tragedy. He was incredibly depressed because of the, the Gallipoli, the charges against him. Uh, he was taunted about it and what have you. Let's just say, to, in his life, that was an incredibly big deal. Uh, perhaps as big or maybe even bigger than the fact that he had a miserable childhood. So, we'll move from 1915 to 1940. And I won't go through all the twists and turns, but uh, through a bit of serendipity, um, actually because Lord Halifax decided he would not accept the prime ministership after uh, Neville Chamberlain uh, was uh, forced out of office, uh, Churchill became prime minister on May 10th. Uh, 1940. As I said, two weeks later, he's in this battle in the War Cabinet over whether or not we should uh, be uh, negotiating with Hitler. Now, I'm, I am, I want to put up this. Of course, this is Neville Chamberlain coming back from Munich, and that piece of paper infamously is a, about a two line uh, writing between he and Adolf Hitler, incidentally, whose birthday happens, today is his birthday, but that's not why we scheduled this. Um, but Churchill, I'm a Churchill, Chamberlain, as I said, to me, this is the epitome of uh, Chamberlain looking like a Boy Scout. Those two lines basically uh, are hand scratched out, and uh, they basically say that. Germany and Britain will never go to war with each other, signed, I promise, uh, Adolf Hitler. 
And we all know, here it is. He's so proud of that. And he is held up to great esteem in the, uh, by the British people for saving humanity, et cetera, et cetera. And of course, we know how valuable those two lines were. It certainly weren't worth the paper it was written on. And he would be out of office uh, about a year and a half later. All right, now, here's a, just a picture of our friend, Mr. Churchill. What was it that allowed him or caused him to say, no, we're not, gonna, we're not going to cut a deal? First of all, of course, he didn't trust Hitler, but who would? Uh, even at that point, Chamberlain didn't trust Hitler. In the book, we list a number of reasons. Uh, on on the um, on the psychological side, there's about half a dozen, and on the factual side, there are probably about twenty. And they start with fairly mundane and, and abstract things, like Churchill had reason to think that Hitler would die or be assassinated or overturned relatively quickly. No, I don't, I don't, I'm not suggesting that that was one of the reasons he, he thought, although it was not a key reason why he thought we should continue or Britain should continue uh, resisting Hitler. But it, it's certainly that, something that could have entered into his mind. And it's certainly, uh, coming up with that list, needless to say, took an awful lot of thought and uh, research. Uh, but I wanted to share with you the couple of reasons that we've come up with as the, what really was driving him, redemption. Here was a man whose father told him, you won't amount to diddly squat. His father, uh, incidentally, his father died when, when Churchill was 18. He died in 1895. Um, I guess he was 19, I'm sorry. Um, this man, as I said, truly detested his son. Winston, in turn, idolized his father. And there's no doubt that he wanted to prove to his dead father, look, look at me. Not only am I prime minister, but I am going to fight a war against evil, and I'm going to win it. I think that, as I said, right up there at the top as to why he did this. He also took, and I think we talked a little bit about this, that through what he picked up from his, his nanny, uh, Elizabeth Everett, he decided that he was going to become the father to the nation, the father that he never had. He was going to show them, he was going to comfort them at incredibly difficult time uh, and show them that they had the fortitude to withstand this. It was, again, something that he never got even close to from his father. The third thing is that inborn in him was the notion that Britain had a duty to stand up for democracy, stand up for what's right in the world, that Britain was the shining light, even though the empire was sort of on the decline, but they had the right and the duty to stand up for Western democracy. This was a, a really driving force in him. And you put those things together, and you've got a powerful reason for him to say, sure, they, they tell me that this is a lost cause. They tell me we can't win. They tell me this is insane. But the British people can do it. 
They can overcome anything they want to overcome. And we have to do this because it is the right thing to do. It is the moral thing to do. And as I said, we can achieve it. Hopefully, they were hoping against hope that they get their men back from Dunkirk, which miraculously they did. They, they, they got off a total of 338,000 people, men off there when they were told they were lucky to get 40,000 off. And of course, he hoped that the United States would enter the war immediately. Well, they didn't do it immediately, eventually. And you know the rest that were here. If Churchill had not done this, his government would soon have been voted out. They would have installed a prime minister who would have cut a deal with Hitler, and the, the world would be totally different today. So um, I just boiled down about 700 pages for you. <laughs> uh, you don't have to read the book now at all. You have it all. Um, it's a fascinating story. And if you read only the first chapter about Churchill's childhood, it's fascinating. There's a comment, and I think I quoted it from someone, who said, in today, Churchill's parents would have been arrested for child abuse. Uh, it is, not only did they treat Winston poorly, but he was also compared constantly to his younger brother who his father believed, well, Winston, you're a screw up, but your brother Jack, he's a really good, good student, he's, he's going to be great, da 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 da. Uh, the emotional abuse that he went through is incredible. Incredible. And to come from that and to be one of the world's great orators, someone who was incredibly prolific, uh, he produced over in his lifetime 500 paintings. And I think he wrote about 60 books, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, won a Pulitzer, uh, a, a, a Nobel Prize for literature. Now, you may have one or two questions about the life and what happened uh, about this man, and I'd be glad to entertain anything and everything. Just hold up your hand, and we have a microphone right up here in the front row. And I'll just let you know, this microphone is for our friends that are uh, on the live stream. It's not for the sound in the room, so just speak up clearly for your friends in the room. In 1943, at the Casablanca Conference, Roosevelt said, I insist on unconditional surrender. How did that affect Churchill? Casablanca Conference, and, and it, this is covered in the, in the book, was, oh, let, me, let me back off a little bit. When the United States first got into the war, you know, they, they kind of got in uh, a little bit by shock. Here it is, Japan. Uh, in, you know, bombed Pearl Harbor. It took the United States to come, a little while to come up to speed, as you might imagine. And uh, politically, they followed Churchill's lead. Now, as time progressed, and about late '42 or so, when when they had invaded North Africa, and then shortly thereafter had the Casablanca Conference things were starting to change. FDR didn't feel like following Churchill's lead anymore. Casablanca is, the, is in my view, an indication where Churchill, uh, FDR demoted Churchill to second place. And it, provide, it, it was kind of a shock to Churchill's system to go from the number one position in the world to number two. Uh, kind of interesting is Churchill was the Winston Churchill that we know of and have in our mind's eye really for about two years and only two years. All his great speeches were done in a period of a little more than a year. Uh, he became, as I said, in, in rank, the second ranks behind FDR and even Stalin 
right around the time of Casablanca. So uh, I, th I think that answers your question, but Casablanca was, a, was, was big in that sense. And that was another blow that Churchill had to live with for the rest, uh, rest of his life. But it certainly impacted him for the rest of the war. And certainly after he was voted out of office in 1945, he said, oh my God, I got demoted in 43, and now they got thrown out of office. Uh, he was pretty depressed after, after all that had occurred. Another question over here. Oh, I thought that was a question back there. That's just our cameraman, okay. I wondered, you mentioned the son, his brother Jack. What did Jack wind up doing in life if he was supposed to be the golden child? He, he didn't turn out to be golden. He was, he, he was sort of a, an assistant to uh, Winston, uh, but he didn't have any particular, particularly outstanding achievements. I mean, he did, uh, I believe he went on to Cambridge where Winston went to a military academy uh, and they, they kind of predicted that would happen, uh, but, but nothing outstanding. You, you know, there are no books written by Jack Churchill or monuments to him any place that I know of. So, uh, anybody else? Oh, any other questions? Here's, a, here's one over here. I'll do this one, then I'll come to you, Joe. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Thank you. All right, okay, I, we keep on shifting like a tennis match. Okay. I wonder if you devote any chapters in your book to Clementine and her role in suggesting many practical things to Winston, such as let's visit the people in the shelters, let's improve their conditions. Um, and also supporting him at times when he was emotionally quite depressed. I, we don't have any chapters per se, but there is much discussion about Clementine being supportive of Winston, and she was. She took over where Elizabeth Everett left off. She and the nurturing of his family provided great support to Winston as, as he proceeded, particularly at Gallipoli or after Gallipoli and numerous other times when he was in his wilderness years after he, uh, in 1929, uh, he was basically out of the cabinet and stayed out of the cabinet for 10 years. And th those were kind of depressing times, and yet she was incredibly supportive. So um, while, uh, while there's not a full chapter on it, th there is a lot of discussion about her. And she does warrant uh, a book to herself. And she really was, uh, I don't, he couldn't have been the man he was without her. There's no doubt about that. Yes. I would recommend the book by Marie Benedict, a PC grad, and also a lawyer. Okay. Herself. Marie Benedict wrote a book on Clementine, uh, an entire book on Clementine, and many other books about unappreciated women, such as Einstein's first wife. Oh, yeah. You know, I, I, I appreciate that. Uh, one thing you find in, in doing Churchill research is that if you if you didn't cut yourself off, you would, you would never get a chance to write the book because there's so much out there to read. Um, uh, well, that, probably that, that says it all, but, but she deserved every good thing that people can say about her. Yes, sir, Jack. Yeah, Winston seems to uh, be noted for quotable quotes some of them very serious, uh, but some of them humorous also. Oh, absolutely. And I'm wondering if you have a favorite, or maybe Ooh. more than one favorite. Oh, God. What's that one? From Lady, he, there's, a, there's a quote between he and Lady Astor and I'm not sure I can do it justice, uh, where he basically says, uh, do, you, do, you do, do you know it better than I do? I don't know it exactly, but it's something to the effect, if I were your wife, I'd poison your tea, and you'd 
and he said, "If I were married to you, I'd take it." Yeah, would. yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was that that right up there. Well, but he, but there are there are so many, so many. Um, yes, ma'am. I was going to say maybe you could talk a little bit about what it was like in London. I told you before you started speaking, I had been in the war rooms um, in London, which was a remarkable experience. Then into some of the underground subways where I know people were taking shelter. And then you see even in you know the 80s and 90s and things when I was visiting, they were still rebuilding parts of London. And so I wondered what role and how did how do sort of people keep going and what was his role in helping people while they literally had stuff dropping out of the skies on them all the time? Well, yeah. I mean, he was a primary uh, cheerleader to bringing up their spirit and say, you know, we, we can prevail, we will prevail. Uh, he, the, the, the king and queen were also very good at that. Um, the you know, the, the Blitz lasted, what, eight months, and they lost 30,000 people in it, and I think 800,000 dwellings, most of them in London. It, it just was an abysmal time. But the British really maintained their spirit incredibly well. Uh, and, and that largely was attributable to, to Churchill's dogged determination. I mean, he was... They call him a bulldog because he really was stubborn. He, you know, he wasn't going to give in. Although, I will say this: there are moments, and we discuss a few of them in the in the book. One where he's flying back from a, a, a meeting in France, uh, where they said, "You know, this is great that now France has dropped out. We'll be able to continue." And he turns to his, it was one of the generals, and he says, "You're crazy. In three months, you and I will be dead." So, I mean, he did have these moments uh, where, you know, he was fearful of what was going to happen, but that never showed. Uh, you know, those were hush, hush, you know, probably, when, I don't know for a guy, but probably when he landed, you know, he was giving the victory sign and we're going to go full forward because that was he in public. So, again... But it, but it goes back to this, this series of events. If Halifax had said, I'll be the prime minister, we wouldn't have had that. If Chamberlain had not supported him in the decision in, in May of, late May 1940, that wouldn't have happened. So these little circumstances that turn out to be big deals. And that, I think that's kind of so interesting about how... Uh, I, in the thing I wrote about Churchill and Zelensky, I made a comment about how sometimes people, leaders, emerge out of nowhere. Like Zelensky, in fact. You know, here was a, a guy on television that didn't have a whole lot of people thinking he'd be this great leader, and yet he was he's able to rally his country. And Churchill was a little bit that way. When he, when he took over, the things that were said about him were just unbelievable, you know. That, uh, the, he surrounded himself with a bunch of thieves. Uh, there were incredibly disparaging things that said to him about him. And actually, Chamberlain was pretty good about this in that Chamberlain, even though he had been thrown out of office, well, sort of thrown out of office, uh, still had a great following amongst the conservatives. And the conservatives bore a lot of ill will toward Churchill, who was, who was a conservative at that point. And Churchill, in his very quiet way, basically, you know, said, you know, let, let's, let's, let's see, you know, let's, let's keep him, uh, let's support him to some degree. And eventually, uh, Chamber, I mean, Churchill, uh, won their support over, of course. And, but um, so, as I said, the, the, the series of little things that uh, produced the Winston Churchill we know of. There's a gentleman back there that I know. Hi, Alan. I was wondering if you could give us a preview of your. Uh, so I was wondering I know, if you could give us a preview yeah. of your Neville Chamberlain book and yep. why 
you're inspired to write that in addition to your Churchill book? Oh, boy. Okay. Nobody's ever asked me that question. Um, I, I know why I wrote the Neville, I mean, why I wrote the Churchill book. I guess I was intrigued that Chamberlain, and, and as I was told Jack, everything you've ever read negative about Chamberlain is true, why he would do something that was so important and so really good for Western democracy. Also, what I was finding is that historians, there must have been at least seven or eight different stories about what Churchill, I'm sorry, what Chamberlain did in the debate on uh, negotiations in the last week of May 1940. They said, oh, he changed his mind. Oh, oh, he really reached his conclusion, you know, at 4.30 4 p.m. on the 27th or the 20th. So it seemed like nobody really knew this, the story. And going back uh, and, and spending time at the Chamberlain Archives in Birmingham, um, I basically concluded that Chamberlain had convinced himself after being such a, a, a appeaser for so many years that you couldn't trust Hitler. Hitler had to be done away with, and we would not negotiate with him. We are going to eliminate him. He did that after the war started, and he really stayed with that, probably to the day he died. And I, I didn't think that anybody had reported on that. And so that's basically what the next book is about. And the only thing other than that I can tell you is it will not be 784 pages. <laughs> uh, oh, not to make, to make things even, uh, the book has 5,500 footnotes. <sighs> Boy, was that a mistake. Um, so there'll probably only be 5,400 in the Chamberlain book. Any other questions? Your professors would have been impressed with the footnotes. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know. It did, that, may, that may reflect insanity on my part. Um, Alan? Did you find something uh, very surprising about Churchill in your research and writing the book? Oh, yeah, I did. I did. Uh, and it, it, was a, it, it came about, and when I, when I came to that point, uh, it was one of the points in writing the book where I didn't like Churchill. It's funny, you... You, you character, these character, even though they're historical, uh, you do rise and fall. Occasionally, you'll see them do things, and you say, "That's pretty, that's pretty awful." So there were a couple of them, and they they all they both in the one that I call to mind involve his writing. Uh, one is that oh, he was someone who always spent more than he made. He was always in debt until very late. After about, well, 1947 or so, he started to become, uh, I was going to say profitable, but he started to do well about 1947. And it had to do with uh, his writings. Prior to that, he wrote a fair amount. He was always, uh, always dictating. Whenever he was writing somebody, he's dictating to a secretary. I can't imagine how he did it, but she was typing in the back of the car as he's dictating a book or something. But he would sign agreements with publishing companies to do, and he'd get a royalty in advance for a book and then never deliver on it. And I said, Geez, that's, that's not, you know, not too good. All right. Another thing that he did is in 1945, well, uh, before that, he had pledged that he would not be writing while he was uh, prime minister, and he didn't keep that pledge. I didn't like that very much, and I was surprised. And the last thing is 
And this sounds very much like uh, things that are happening or have happened recently. When his uh, prime ministership ended, he took an awful lot of private papers that really belonged to the government. <laughs> and he took them home and he said, I'm going to write books based on this stuff. I don't, well, I guess some of that must have been secret too, but. Now, Clement Attlee, uh, he, he didn't care. Why? Winston, if you want to go off to Chartwell and stay out of Parliament and write books, God, God bless you. You know, stay out of my hair. You write to your heart's content. If you want, take these documents, ha have at it. So those are three instances where I was surprised and disappointed. I sort of came back later on to say, eh, I, kinda, I, I would love to have him for, for dinner one night. You know. Came full circle. Yeah, came full circle. Yeah. Chamberlain didn't come full circle. Well, a little bit. I'm, I'm not suggesting that Chamberlain is entitled to redemption, but he did do at least one thing right. Well, I, I'll tell you this, though. If you ever go to the University of Birmingham, where Chamberlain was a student for two years, and he started off doing engineering, no less, and commuting, which I could, uh, I said, having done both of those things, and he, he also he was not very good at it, actually. Uh, now, what was I going to say about Chamberlain? Oh, okay. But, uh, oh, I know what it was. You will find nothing on the exterior of the University of Birmingham to show that Chamberlain ever attended. There is a large tower uh, on campus which is devoted to his father. But Neville? Actually, there was a, a bust inside the room where I was working, and I figured it was Neville. And one day on a, a little break, I walked over. It was Anthony Eden. <laughs> the only evidence of Chamberlain that I could find was that picture of him at the airport holding up. And I said, of all the pictures in all the world, they had to hang that one up. So as far as they're concerned, I, I would say he doesn't exist. Okay, well, so, so don't rush off to the University of Birmingham. I, uh, that might be my, my suggestion. With that, I'd like to thank you for your questions, for your attention, and if you're interested in more, we've got 784 pages and yet more to come. Uh, it'll keep you busy for at least a week. Actually, somebody did read it in, in about a week, so I'm not suggesting you have to, but... I, yeah, well, you might be able to finish it while you're in that. Uh, I, I have tried mightily to get my wife, who, who was one of the proofreaders, to reread it. And for some reason, she's resisted. I, I don't know. She says, I already read it. I know. Well, then, of course, when I, when I cross-examine her about it, she, she pleads the fifth. So. Can we all thank, thank Alan you. for being here today? And Alan, this is just a little thank you. We like to give our speakers a little gift to thank oh, them for their thank time. thank you very much. Thank Pretty you. light, too. It's not, it's not a copy of my book. I can <laughs> <No. remember> that. <laughs> Can't uh, use that as a doorstop. Oh. Um, well, again, remember, I said it, 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 it is very useful. For that. For that. Thank you all for being here today. Like Alan mentioned, he does have his books here for sale if you're interested. And I will, I will autograph it. So. Exactly. So feel free. Linger if you'd like, but uh, we're all set for today, and hopefully we'll see you with our next events coming up next month as well as uh, in June. Take care, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.